In today's video, the author of the letter to the Hebrews tells us that it's time to grow up. Last time we ended at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, which read, And he, Christ, became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, designated by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Our first of two passages today picks up on that thought. This is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. About him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become slow of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the elements of the beginning of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to the perfect, that is, those who, because of exercise, have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. So, what he says in, in verse 11, as, he, as he's continuing the thought, is that we have a lot to tell you about Melchizedek and how he connects to Jesus, the Christ, the Savior, the high priest, and the king, but you can't handle all this information yet. And so in verses 12 to 14, he says that by now, you really should be teaching the faith to other people, but instead, you've become inattentive and you need to be retaught the basics of the faith. That's what the elements of the beginning of the oracles of God means. You need to go back to the beginning and, and get taught all this stuff over again. And he uses this idea of, of infants and adults and food, that you should be eating solid food like adults, but instead you've reverted to a spiritual infancy and you need milk again. You can't handle the solid food. A second century a writer, Clement of Alexandria, wrote, writing to the Hebrews, who were declining again from faith to the law, he says you need someone to teach you the elements of the beginning of the oracles of God. They are moving from faith back to a concern with the observances of the law. And, and they don't know the basics of the faith. When I was a priest in New York, I had a parishioner, and, and he is what is known as a revert. So uh, a convert is somebody who, who comes to the Orthodox faith from another faith tradition. A revert is somebody who's been Orthodox all their life, but at some moments they just it, the light goes on and they start realizing the, the beauty and, and the value and the wisdom of the faith. When I'd visit this gentleman, we'd have a coffee and we'd talk, and he would say the same thing every single time. He'd say, Father... People don't know the basics of the faith. They don't know the basics. And he would just do this over and over and over again. And, uh, and so this is what's going on here in, uh, in, in Hebrews 5. You can, you can hear the frustration in these words. I kind of wonder if, if what's going on here, at least in part, is that he's writing to the second generation of Christians who are maybe taking for granted this, this treasure that their parents discovered, you know, that they, they, they embraced and they, they intentionally saw it. And it, but for, this, for the ones that grew up in it, it's kind of like, well, yeah, but this is all we've ever known. And you know what? It's this little tiny group and we're getting all sorts of pressure. And hey, you know what? Maybe it would be just easier if we just went back. Now, that's, that's in no way, like, that's just me musing. But I kind of thought about that. Now, in verse uh, 13... Father Lawrence says that the author calls this advanced teaching the word of righteousness because it can be absorbed only by those who are already righteous and have reached a certain level of spiritual maturity. And St. John Chrysostom, talking about the word of righteousness, says it can have two possible meanings. The word, capital W, word of righteousness, that is Christ, so learning about Christ, or possibly Christ, 
the teaching about righteous living. And again, he doesn't say it's one or the other, but he leaves it open as to the, that it could be both. And, and you know, it, it has both levels to it. You can look at it in both ways. Now, that second one is important, the teaching about righteous living. Because, you know, when we, when we teach the faith, so we, we have catechumens, we teach catechism. What do we teach? Doctrine, worship, history, sacred art, all of these things. Ancient Christian catechisms didn't lead off with that. Ancient Christian catechisms led off with how to live an authentic Christian life. There's a very old uh, document, it's late 1st, early 2nd century, called the Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles to the Gentiles. And it is believed to be a manual for newly received converts, so newly baptized, newly confirmed people in the faith. And it begins with these words. There are two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And there is a great difference between these two ways. In verse 13, it says that the sol solid food belongs to the perfect. And this relates to something else in this, in this reading that we're looking at tonight, which is in chapter 6, verse 1, when we are called to go to perfection. And perfect here, again, it's, it's this word in Greek that also means completion or fulfillment. So the solid food, the higher teachings of the faith, belong to those who have reached a full spiritual maturity, not the, the ones who are without sin and think, because who's without sin? But it's those who have reached this spiritual maturity. And we also read in verse 14 that this spiritual maturity comes from exercising the faith. And Father Lawrence again says, the words translated exercise in Greek exis and trained gymnazo, compare our English word gymnastic, have an, an athletic feel to them and show that attaining spiritual maturity is a matter of discipline and exertion such as athletes must have to attain excellent excellence in their fields also. So it's this imagery of the Christian life being an athletic effort. And also in verse 14, we read that the fruit of this spiritual maturity is the gift of discernment to be able to know the difference between good and evil, which is not always that easy to figure out. If you go all the way back to the beginning, in the beginning and in the Garden of Eden, you know, Eve looks at the, the, at the fruit of the tree that they're not supposed to partake of, and she, it says, and it looked good, you know, look, look pretty nice. So we don't always uh, authentically, accurately tell the difference between what's good and what's not good, what's going to bring us closer to God and what's going to push us farther away from God. And so we need to grow in our discernment, our, our ability to, to figure all of that out. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that we, are, we, we get as we grow in Christ is a deeper sense about right and wrong, life and death, and the, the path we need to follow and the path we need to avoid. And also in verse 14, we learn that this discernment grows by reason of use. You see, if we don't exercise our spiritual senses, if we do not engage in this effort, these things begin to atrophy. They get weaker and weaker. And the less we use them, the harder it becomes to discern right and wrong. And so this is what he says in verse 11, that they have become slow of hearing because of their own negligence and laziness. And just like a muscle, just like anything in our bodies, if we don't engage it, if we don't exercise it, we end up moving backwards. Okay, our second of the two readings today is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary word about the Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of dippings, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do 
if God allows. We have a call to action in this section. Let us press on to maturity in Christ. And Father Lawrence, uh, speaking about the section, does make one clarification or one point here about verse 1. He says that this is not about faith versus works. The author of our, our epistle, he writes, is not teaching here the barren uselessness of good works, but rather the necessity of building life upon repentance, upon this idea of turning back to God. In the context of this, of this passage, you know, why, what's going on here? Well, the author is saying that, that this is all ground that we, we covered already. We've covered all this at the very beginning of your of your journey into Christianity. Remember, he's writing uh, to to uh, to uh, Jewish Christians who are, are are kind of drifting away, are struggling with maybe going back to Judaism, or maybe have even gone back to Judaism. And so he's and 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 so these are all the questions you've already it's asked and answered, like they say in some of the in some of the lawyer TV shows. Uh, then in verse two he kind of unpacks what these basic teachings are. And so then we have four things that are listed here. The first one is, uh, Father Lawrence's translation calls it dippings. And uh, other translations, and the word uh, in Greek literally means baptisms. That's what it means. But Father Lawrence points out here that this word baptisms is used in two different ways in the New Testament, depending on how you spell it. Baptisma, with an A at the end, is the sacrament of baptism, the threefold immersion in water as a rite of initiation into the faith. Baptismos, with an OS at the end, relates to these the washing that was done in Judaism for ritual purification. We have to appreciate exactly how important these purification rites were for Jews, because it meant worshiping God or not worshiping God. What the author of Hebrews is saying is this is not that serious in the life of, of God's people, in the life of the faithful. This is one of these elementary things that we should be beyond already. Um, in the Orthodox Study Bible, the note about this says, baptisms are all the rites of washing, including those of the Old Testament and of John the Baptist, the, the, the baptism of John the Baptist, and it says, but because all of these things are fulfilled by Christ in the sacrament of baptism. So all of these washings are typology. They are all pointing to the, to the washing of rebirth that happens in baptism. Because uh, Christian baptism is also understood as, as, a, as a washing uh, away of sins, but the meaning is connected to the, to the ministry of Christ as our Savior that the freedom from sin happens through the death and resurrection of Christ, and that baptism is, in fact, a participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That through our baptisms, we participate in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Father Lawrence makes a couple of very important points here, important things we need to, to take notice of. First of all, he writes, even infants, although having no personal sins at the time of their baptism, still receive a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, in that baptism brings them into a relationship with Christ in which forgiveness is always available. And he also says here, we miss the, rich, the richness of this concept of rebirth through baptism if we see it in strictly individualistic terms. There is a cosmic element to our regeneration. In the coming age, the whole cosmos will share in Christ's glory and will be reborn. Also in verse 2, he mentions the laying on of hands. And this act of the laying on of hands has several uses in Scripture. Um, conferring a blessing, healing, the ordination of clergy in the New Testament, and also in the New Testament, conferring the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are born from above through our baptisms and also through receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, we read about Peter and John, and it says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They'd only been baptized in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So this thing that, that happened to them at Pentecost with tongues of fire, they confer to others from that point on through this act of the laying on of hands. Uh, then they give the authority to their successors, the bishops, to do it as well. And so this was the ancient Christian practice was what we call chrismation, uh, what in the West is called confirmation, was was a ministry of the bishop. He would, through the laying on of hands, that he would he would bring the person into full communion through this this baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the Christian East, eventually priests were given the authority to to grant the gift of the Holy Spirit through a special oil, anointing with a special oil called chrism. Chrism is the from the Greek word meaning gift, and so when we anoint, we say the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But preparing the Holy Chrism is something only the bishops do. So in a sense, the hands of the bishops are still involved in, the, in, in that, that confirmation, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, but the priests are given, in, I guess you could say, proxy to do it through the Holy Chrism, which they receive from the bishop because it's the bishops that bless it. Father Lawrence makes an important observation when he talks about the laying on of hands. He says that all of this implies that the church has a singular authority to bless and to heal to forgive, to empower for ministry. The church has the authority to do these things. He writes, because the church was the fullness of Christ, the dwelling place of God, an island of light in a sea of darkness. Next up in verse two, the resurrection from the dead. Now this was the dominant belief in Judaism, but not all Jews believed it. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in it. This is one of the things that they challenged Jesus on when he was preaching the gospel. Uh, we clearly see uh, the promise of the resurrection in the dead in the Old Testament. For example, the prophet Ezekiel says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And most Jews believed that the resurrection of the dead would happen when the Messiah arrived to inaugurate his kingdom. So, they said, if Jesus was the Messiah, where is the resurrection of the dead? And the answer, and Paul talks about this, that yes, Jesus the Savior, the Christ, inaugurates the universal resurrection, but this is an unfolding reality. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 24, we read, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits." Afterward, those who are, who are Christ's at his coming. And again, Father Lawrence makes an important distinction here. We do not just be, come back to life in the resurrection, but we become partakers in Christ's life, in his resurrection. He writes, in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, the fourth one that is listed in verse 2 is the judgment the Messiah would judge all nations. That was also a belief of Judaism. Psalm 82, 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for to you belongs all the nations. And the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 39 says, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. And of course, in the creed, we say that Christ shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. Here is one of the unique teachings of Eastern Orthodoxy, that the glory of God is important because it's not just that, that the resurrection is going to be a glorious moment, but we will be judged 
by that glory. Our lives, our hearts will be revealed by the glory of Christ shining upon us and shining within us. Father Thomas Hopko writes, The very presence of Christ as the truth and the light is itself the judgment of the world. Father Thomas Hopko also writes, All are raised from the dead into everlasting life. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, John 5, 29. In the end, God will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Now, this is really important. For those who love God, resurrection from the dead and the presence of God will be paradise. For those who hate God, resurrection from the dead and the presence of God will be hell. This is the teaching of the fathers of the church. So heaven and hell are not places. They are the, uh, the, the subjective experience of the presence and glory of God around us and within us, depending on the trajectory of our lives. The final judgment will not be a tribunal that decides right then and there where one is going, going to go. The final judgment is an unveiling of the trajectory that one is already heading on. The passage ends by saying, this we will do, or this let us do, if God allows, which is to say, getting on to the, the higher things, the higher teachings, we'll do that if God allows us to. And this is a very good example of the Semitic worldview. The Semitic peoples, the Jews, the Arabs are also Semitic people, and, and the worldview says, whatever happens, whatever is going on, is going on because God lets it happen. So we will get on to the higher things. We'll get past all of this stuff if God allows us to. The topics we looked at today would have been very good for Jewish inquirers. We have baptism. We have the laying on of hands. We believe in the resurrection and the eternal judgment. So what's the difference? As valid as these questions are, the faithful that the author is writing to now should be past them already and ready to look into the deeper elements of the faith. It's not that we can't look at the basics again and review them, but there's a difference between reviewing them as believers and sliding back into unbelief and then needing to be convinced all over again. Father Barnabas Powell, in his Faith and Courage blog, writes, We simply cannot live in the fantasy world that our faith can stay childish forever. The only choices are either to be unfaithful and orthodox in name only or to finally grow up and really be orthodox on purpose. There's no holding pattern in our spiritual life. The moment we stop moving, we start drifting backwards. We need to press forward intentionally and actively to spiritual maturity, to what St. Paul called in his letter to the Ephesians, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hello, this is Father Andrew. You've just been watching some excerpts from one of our online Bible study sessions at St. Nicholas Church. If you'd like to join us on Zoom for a Bible study, you will be more than welcome. Just send me a message through the contact information on the screen. You can also find it in the notes below this video, and we would love for you to join us. Don't forget that you can also watch live streams of our Sunday services on Facebook. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will be able to get other content like sermons and other videos that we post. Thanks for joining us today. Until next time, take care and God bless.